You know, one of the lies that the enemy uses against us is that the pressures we feel are unique, that nobody's ever had pain like I do or the challenges that I do. Just a casual review of history will help you understand that's not true. Folks, cancel culture is not new. People have been trying to shut people up from telling a Jesus story since Jesus was here, and they're still doing it. We've got to decide if we have the courage to stand for the truth, to tell our God story, to stand up for Jesus of Nazareth as our Lord, our friend, and our King. I wanna pray for you that God will give you His boldness, not recklessness, but He'll give us His boldness. Father, thank you for your word, for the truth it brings to us, for the hope it brings to our lives. You have changed us. Use our lives and our words. May they be pleasing in your sight. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you. The power of one. I interact with Christians in our community and, and beyond on a regular basis, and some of the prevailing attitudes are of despair. You know, I just don't feel like I can make any difference, or, or some people are just trying to wish away the, the current trends. You know, the, the beginning of last year in 2020, without notice or warning, we all embarked on a journey. We didn't volunteer for it. We didn't know that it was going to be thrust upon us, but it was. We, we left the place of the familiar. And at this point in our journey, it seems abundantly clear that we're not returning. Now, that, that isn't a, a statement of dire circumstance. It's simply a reality. The world we lived in at the beginning of last year has shifted. And our, our ultimate destination is not yet clear. And I'm not talking about heaven or hell in the midst of this social change. The outcome is not yet clear. And so I, the, the, one of the responses that's prevalent is the despair. I, I feel like I, I don't make any difference. My voice isn't being heard. I don't know what to do. And the other response that is most common is just trying to wish it away. If I don't talk about it, if I act like it's not there, maybe we'll go back to where we were before. And neither of those responses are helpful. And, and really the, the fundamental idea is one person cooperating with God, listening to God, can make an enormous difference in our world. But it, it means that it begins with us. We can't point our fingers at someone else or the wicked or the immoral or somebody that you think is the causation or somebody that was elected that you didn't like or somebody that wasn't elected, whatever. It's the hearts of God's people. No more excuses. We can no longer afford to yield to fear. Don't welcome fear into your heart or your home. Treat fear as an uninvited guest that's eating everything in the refrigerator and pushing you out of your space. Think of fear as a person without a body and begin to speak to him in the authority of Jesus' name. You have no right over my thoughts. You have no right over my life. I, I will not be dominated by fear. In Jesus' name, you go. I am not a slave to fear. There's another spirit at work in my body. So the real goal of this little series of messages, and if you're newer to the church or newer to listening, uh, Wednesday night, Saturday night, and Sunday are each individual um, talks. But the real goal is to combat that despair and that fear and that indifference. If you have, think you can uh, insulate yourself, you can cocoon in a state of ambivalence, not my problem, I'm doing just fine. My income is held up. My family's doing okay. I'm going to take care of me and mine and the rest of it's not in my business. You're forfeiting your kingdom assignment. And so it, it's those, those responses I really want to address. We're looking at some troubling things. It really was introduced to us with a coronavirus that originated apparently in Wuhan, China. Not a criticism of Wuhan. We typically identify diseases based on their origin. One of our goals is to begin to tell the truth again. But it's had an enormous impact upon schools and businesses. Out of that has come censorship in a way that we've never known it, or at least not in decades and decades. And with censorship, with limiting the free flow of ideas or preventing the truth to be told and trying to control what is being said, comes with that then a very intentional effort towards propaganda, which is overwhelming these days. An escalation in hatred and violence manipulation in some of the broadest ways we've ever seen from monitoring your data and tracking what you do and using it as a weapon to broad, broad spread advocacy for immorality 
ever increasing intolerance, lawlessness, violence being unleashed in our cities, immigration crisis, the religion of woke. And that's just a quick overview. Underlying all of those things, underlying all those expressions, and we could have made that list three times as long, something is happening that's beyond logic. It's not simply about following the science. I'm a person of science. I'm quite willing to do that. Science is reproducible. Science posits a theory and evaluates it in reality and then adjusts the theory and corrects it. That isn't what we're watching for the most part. There's more to the story. Underlying all of those things, there's a spiritual reality. There's a response from the church that is essential and vital and necessary. Your life and your choices are of great significance. The power of one godly person makes a difference. Stop agreeing with the enemy. And I don't mean a political party. Stop agreeing with the kingdom of darkness that whispers in your ear, you don't matter. You do matter. The creator of all things knows your name. He sent his son to die on a cross for you. You do matter. I've been encouraging you for months now to watch and to listen, to think and to act. And you can't interrupt that progression. If all you do is watch and listen, you're just a voyeur. And if you watch and listen and think, you're just a pseudo intellectual. It takes action, church. We've been passive for long enough. We are a nation with a Christian heritage. The values that have shaped our legal system, our schools, our universities, the environment in which we have done business, the character of our nation has not been perfectly, but has unquestionably been shaped by a Judeo-Christian worldview. And I will not be quiet when someone moves in and says, we're gonna replace that. Nor should you be. And our action is directed towards the spiritual tools that have been handed to us. There's a great temptation to be silenced. I'll just stay below the radar. Let somebody else go. Let somebody else speak. Let somebody else use their voice. It's a tremendous deception to imagine that you're powerless, unable to affect outcomes in this world. I would remind you of our Lord. He was born in a barn, a stable. He had no wealth to speak of, no access to power, no exemplary education. He lived as an exile in Egypt when he was a young child because powerful forces sought his destruction. And in spite of all the things he didn't have, he changed humanity for time and eternity. And that same spirit indwells you. Now, what will be said of the church in this generation? The answer is not clear yet. Our response is incomplete. It was unsettling last year when the voices said that you're non-essential, shut up and stay home. And we said, thank you. How dare they? Well, I wanna walk through this with you a little bit tonight. We started on the last session. I wanna continue and I wanna identify a couple of points that I think will help ground us. We are on an assignment and we are under authority. We tend to think of it as my life, my days, my schedule, my calendar, my money, my dreams. Not if you're a Christ follower. Those are the words of someone who's not a Christ follower. Those are the words of someone who is sitting on the throne of their life. To be a Christ follower says that we have offered ourselves as living sacrifices. That we say to our Lord and King, what would you have me do with this day? How would you have me spend my time this year? What would you have me do with my resources and my talent? And if that hasn't been your understanding and it hasn't been the way you've approached your life, I would encourage you just to quietly, not in this moment, but for the next, just begin quietly to say to the Lord, Lord, I'm sorry. I really have not had any intent of serving you. I, mean, I didn't want to go to hell. And I didn't really want to be a Buddhist. It wasn't that I was choosing another religion, but I had no intention of laying my life before you. I've just asked you to bless my plan. Bless what I wanted. I've asked you to use your power to give me my wants. 
And now, Lord, with humility, I would like to offer whatever my life represents for your purposes. Amen. Folks, we're on assignment. This is our watch. This is serious stuff. We're under authority. First Samuel 2 and verse 9 says, He keeps the feet of his godly ones, but the wicked ones are silenced in darkness. For not by might shall a man prevail. We've got to be certain. We start to talk about the power of one. We think about, well, I'm not very strong and my contacts are limited and my resources are small and nobody cares about my opinion. The creator of all things does. It's not by might that we will prevail. It's by the spirit of the living God. Church, that's our story. Zechariah 4 and verse 6 says, this is the word of the Lord to Zerubbabel. Bless his heart. Was he 14 before he could spell his name? <laughs> Anybody remember Zerubbabel? He rebuilt the temple in Jerusalem. Man of great significance. Not by might nor by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord Almighty. You see, the scripture invites us to the imagination that the spirit of God is involved in history. Zerubbabel's not offering some theoretical discussion. He has a task that's impossible. Israel at that time is an occupied nation. They're under foreign domination. And yet he's going to rebuild the temple in Jerusalem. Not by might nor by power, but by my spirit. Do you believe the spirit of God is still involved in history? I hope so. We can either align our lives with God or in opposition to God. It's your choice. But there's no third option. Where you work, where you go to school, where you engage in your neighborhood, you're either aligned with the purposes of God or you're in opposition to them. Again, just to be clear, we're being invited to align our choices and our behaviors with something beyond our physical world. What we're watching in the daily news cycle are symptoms of a spiritual conflict that's raging throughout the earth. Second Chronicles 32 and verse 7, Hezekiah is king in Jerusalem. There's a threat from a foreign king. His name is Sennacherib, harder to spell than Zerubbabel. And this is the message that Hezekiah gives to the people. They're outnumbered. The, the military technology of the enemies that have come against Jerusalem exceeds the capabilities of the, the armies of Israel, the armies of Judah. And this is the message, be strong and courageous, do not be afraid or discouraged because of the king of Assyria and the vast army with him. For there is a greater power with us than with him. With him is only the arm of flesh, but with us is the Lord our God to help us and to fight our battles. And the people gained confidence from what Hezekiah, the king of Judah said. Again, I'm asking you to begin to meditate, to think about, to reflect upon the power of one who is in relationship to the king of all kings. We are not powerless. Amen. Some of you prefer the New Testament. It's not an either or choice. But in Acts chapter five, the Peter and John and the crew are trying to figure out what to do. Jesus is gone and they have this message to tell. And they're having some exciting results, but they're meeting some pretty significant opposition. In fact, they've been arrested and they brought before the same body of people that orchestrated Jesus' execution. And Peter and the other apostles replied, we must obey God rather than men. Folks, it's the same today. We have to obey God. We have to obey God. Amen. You need to let that settle on your heart. We have to obey God. Amen. If we don't, what makes us think we are God's people? A plaque? A certificate? They're on trial here. This isn't a theology session. They're not in a class in the university or a Bible study or a small group or even a sermon. They're standing before the people that executed, ordered, orchestrated the execution of Jesus. We must obey God rather than men. The God of our fathers raised Jesus from the dead, whom you had killed by hanging him on a tree. They're not going quietly down this path. 
God exalted him to his own right hand as prince and savior that he might give repentance and forgiveness of sins to Israel. We are witnesses of these things and so is the Holy Spirit whom God has given to those who obey him. Boom! That is not a conciliatory response. That is not an olive branch. Now it's true. And look at the response. When they heard this, they were furious and they wanted to put them to death. The power of one. Most of us think, well, I hope it's another one. (laughs) I want to walk through John's gospel with you and we'll need to do it pretty quickly. There's a perspective that John presents us. There's a a phrase and and a perspective that he uses repeatedly. It's rooted in this notion of afraid of the Jews. And there's different reasons given and different responses presented. But what's consistent through John's gospel is that time after time after time, there were responses presented because of the fear of the Jews. And it's not the Jewish population. It was the power brokers, the ones who established what was politically correct, what could be said in the public square and what could not. It was an issue. And I'll start with one, and I've tried to either give them an explanation or a little bit of a label. We're going to start in John chapter 9. It's where we meet a man who is born blind. I hope most of you know the miracle story. The man doesn't ask Jesus for anything. In fact, the disciples call Jesus' attention to the man with a theological question. They could have cared less about the man. And Jesus, in an expression of mercy and kindness, pauses And he he spits in the dust, makes some mud and smears it on the man's face and says, go wash in the pool of Siloam. And the pool of Siloam is at the bottom of the hill of the city of Jerusalem. All the city is is uphill from that point. The man's got a, a bit of a journey. There was water within an arm's reach, but Jesus said, you go wash in that pool. It's almost as if he's picking on him. And the man offers no explanation. He doesn't say that you're mistreating me. He doesn't tweet out how unkind Jesus is. He go the Bible and in John, it very, in an understated way, it says he went and washed and he came home seeing. <laughs> I would submit to you, dude, came home seeing. Don't you think, huh? Whole city stirred. So it comes to the attention of the power brokers in the city. And they don't want anybody saying that Jesus is doing miracles and doing good things. So they bring the man in. They've got to shape his story. What we're watching is not new. It is not new. The question is, what are we going to do and what are we going to be? John 9, 18, this is the backside of the story. The Jews still did not believe that he'd been blind and had received his sight until they sent for the man's parents. They just weren't going to accept his personal testimony. It didn't matter how many of the shopkeepers near where he'd been when Jesus interacted with him affirmed the story that it was the man that was blind. They are not going to believe it. We're not accepting that. It doesn't fit the narrative. Go get his parents. Verse 19, they ask, is this your son? Is this the one you say was born blind? You say was born blind. How is it that now he can see? And the parents answered, we know he's our son. That's our boy. And we know he was born blind. But how he can see now or who opened his eyes, we don't know. Ask him. He's of age. He'll speak for himself. What supportive folks these are. (laughs) Huh? Huh? I mean, this isn't what you're expecting, right? Their son who's never seen is looking at them. Maybe they're a little happy, right? Maybe they're going, take us to the man that did it. We want to thank him. We want to buy him dinner. We want to, we want to celebrate everybody. This is our son. He can see. No, 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 no. That's our boy. Yesterday he couldn't see And apparently today he can. (laughs) You better ask him about it. (laughs) I mean, it's so wrong. 
You need the next sentence. His parents said this because they were afraid of the Jews. For already the Jews had decided that anyone who acknowledged that Jesus was the Messiah would be put out of the synagogue. And just in case it was lost on the reader, John adds the next sentence. That was why his parents said, he's of age, ask him. They're not about to give up their place in the synagogue. The second time they summoned the man who'd been blind, give glory to God, they said, we know this man is a sinner. And he replied, whether he's a sinner or not, like, I don't know. One thing I do know, I was blind. And I see you. <laughs> he doesn't care where they put him out of. He's not going to tow the party line. I label this country club syndrome. When you're overly interested in the privileges of membership. Now I'm very conscious. I read a lot of the literature of the church and try to stay aware of what's happening in the broader church world. We have lots of words to excuse our silence. We talk about being covert operatives. We're bridge builders. We have a greater opportunity for good if we're not disruptive. So we turn down the volume on Jesus. And we don't talk so much about what we believe. Because after all, we're trying to win hearts and minds with what? Deception? It feels awkward to me. There's a blind man in this narrative without resources, without support from a broader group, and he manages to stir Jerusalem to its core to consider Jesus in a new way because he has the courage to tell his God story. Amen. The pressure wasn't just on his parents. The pressure was greater on him. Just say what you're supposed to say. Stop with that narrative already. The parents' priorities are greatly misplaced. Their son, who was formerly blind, can see. Gratitude would be a better response. We have to guard our hearts. Whose approval do you want? How happy are you to be invited into some circle? To be included for yourself or someone you care about so that you'll be silenced. What we're walking through these days is not new. Folks, the cancel culture is not a new thing. It's as old as human civilization. John chapter 12, different context, different story. Verse 37, John 12, even after Jesus had done all these miraculous signs in their presence, they still wouldn't believe in him. This was to fulfill the word of Isaiah the prophet, Lord who has believed our message and to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed. Isaiah said this because he saw Jesus' glory and spoke about him. Yet at the same time, even many among the leaders believed in him, in Jesus. But because of the Pharisees, they would not confess their faith for fear they would be put out of the synagogue. For they loved praise from men more than praise from God. It's a little blind. We're, we're removed by a couple thousand years and the culture is not immediately apparent to us. But the power brokers in Jerusalem were the most powerful and the wealthiest people in the nation. I wish I could pick you up and take you to Jerusalem this evening. We, we could walk through a 5,000 square foot house complete with beautiful tile floors and multiple bathrooms. A lavish home on the side of a hill overlooking the Temple Mount. And the scholars agree, the Jewish scholars agree, that it was most likely a home of one of the, the religious leaders. Prime real estate, beautiful house. So when it says they're not willing to, to believe, that they're not willing to acknowledge in spite of the miracles, that they love the praise of men, it's not just affirmation, they like the life they're leading. And they're not about to use their voice to put that at risk. They understand there's a consequence because the people who are standing in opposition to Jesus tell them blatantly, boldly, repeatedly, if you are affirming of him, you'll forfeit your place. 
Sound familiar? We're not the first generation to face this. It intrigues me. Verse 41 says, Isaiah said this. Said what? Said, Lord, who's believed our message and whom is the arm of the Lord to whom has been revealed? Isaiah said this because he saw Jesus' glory. If you don't know the timeline from the whiteboard Bible, you could miss this. You read that, you think Isaiah lived next door to Mary and Joseph. Isaiah lived 500 years before Jesus. Isaiah had a revelation of Jesus hundreds of years before his birth. And he believed in Jesus. And now there's a problem in Jerusalem because even after all the miracles Jesus has done, the people who have seen them will not believe. We have a little idiom, a little expression we use, seeing is believing. No, it's not. You can see and not choose to believe. They saw the miracles and chose not to believe. Belief begins with a decision. You decide to be a believer. You decide to yield to the authority of scripture. You decide to yield to the, to the Lordship of Jesus Christ. If you're stubborn and skeptical and rebellious and an unbeliever, you can't see enough evidence to cause you to convert. You have to choose to believe. It takes courage and strength to believe in God. We're not the first generation to be threatened if we stand up for Jesus. This is not the first time the world has seen this. It's an old song. I mean, it's wrapped up in some new delivery systems. We've got some new forms of technology and some new forms of communication, but the threat's not new. The question is, who are we going to be? The power of one. What you choose to believe makes a difference. Let's go on. John chapter 12. Verse nine, meanwhile, a large crowd of Jews found out that Jesus was there and came not only because of him, but also to see Lazarus, whom he'd raised from the dead. They're in Bethany. I doubt you'd know the geography of the area too well. Jerusalem, there's a valley just to the east of Jerusalem, the Kidron Valley, and on the opposite side of the valley, it's a deep valley. On the opposite side of that valley is the Mount of Olives. You probably know the Mount of Olives. It's where the Garden of Gethsemane is. It's where Jesus went with his disciples when he ascended back to heaven. Well, from the crest of the Mount of Olives on a clear day, and they're not always clear because the dust from the desert sometimes hangs in the air, but on a clear day, you can see the Dead Sea. It's just barely 20 miles away. But just on the other side of the crest of the Mount of Olives is the village, the city of Bethany. Today in Arabic, El Lazaria, after Lazarus. And it's in Bethany where Mary and Martha and Lazarus lived. So it was in, in Bethany where Jesus raised Lazarus from the dead. Now, why does that matter? Jesus has done lots of miracles in the northern part of Israel, in the Galilee. We used contemporary U.S. geography. It's kind of like saying, you know, you did some miracles in Murfreesboro, but it's a different thing to go to Madison Square Garden. Because Lazarus was dead several days. And he was raised to life again. That kind of a story would get around. And Lazarus is close enough that he, wa he shops. He walks the markets in the streets of Jerusalem. So there's finger pointing and whispering. That's the one. Now Jesus has come back and he's in Bethany. And he's had a meal with his friends. And a large crowd finds out that Jesus is there. And they've come because of him. But not only because of him. They've come to see Lazarus. I mean, not very many people know people that were dead for three or four days. <laughs> and you can have coffee with them. <laughs> so the chief priest made plans to kill Lazarus as well. For on account of him, many of the Jews were going over to Jesus and putting their faith in him. I label this one a desperate attempt to hide the truth. If we can't deny it, if we can't say he wasn't born blind... If we can't intimidate you not into, into not saying something, if we can't put so much pressure on you with so much economic threat or physical threat that we can't get you to withdraw, we will hide the truth. We will bury it. And if it means we have to silence you, ultimately we'll do that too. It's illogical. This isn't a foreigner amongst them. It's not a Roman centurion who's using his power to abuse children or mistreat women or to exact wealth. 
He's fulfilling dozens and dozens of the prophecies that are in their own books. He's the answer to their prayers, but he's inconvenient because he's challenging their power and their comfort and their convenience. And we will shut him up and we'll shut up anyone who is an advocate for him. What we're facing is not new. John 19. In following, we're just doing this chronologically. This is after Jesus' death. Later, Joseph of Arimathea asked Pilate for the body of Jesus. Now, Joseph was a disciple of Jesus, but secretly because he feared the Jews. There's that line again. John just keeps pushing it back at us. Now, Joseph is a wealthy man. Not anybody could just walk into the governor's office and ask for the, the body of somebody. He's an influential man. He's a powerful man. He's a believer in Jesus. But he's been bullied into silence. He's a secret believer. And now Jesus is dead. And in his brokenness, it's as if Joseph says, you know, I just don't care anymore. Pilate, can I have his body? With Pilate's permission, he came and took the body away. He was accompanied by Nicodemus the man who earlier had visited Jesus at night. Some of you may, and some of you may not remember, in John chapter 3, a man comes to see Jesus under the cover of darkness. His name was Nicodemus, and John tells us that he was a, a, a leader amongst the Jews. And he said, Rabbi, I know nobody could do the miracles you do unless he came from God. And Jesus said to Nicodemus, how is it that a ruler of my people doesn't understand that you can't see the kingdom of God unless you're born again? How can it be? And Nicodemus steps back into the shadows after that little interaction. We haven't heard from him until we get to John chapter 19 and Jesus has died on a cross. You have to have the imagination that the horrors that Jesus has gone through perhaps brought out some of these secret people. Don't you know there's a brokenness in them? Joseph goes to Pilate and says, I want his body. I don't care what people say. I don't care who knows. And Nicodemus comes. He was accompanied by Nicodemus, the man who earlier had visited Jesus at night. Nicodemus brought a mixture of myrrhs and aloes, about 75 pounds, expensive. We're told that uh, in, in Bethany, back in John 12, a woman poured perfume on Jesus' feet and she was criticized for it. He said, we could have eaten with months of the cost of that perfume. What do you think 75 pounds of that would be worth? Nicodemus doesn't matter, care what it cost. Taking Jesus' body, the two of them wrapped it. I think it's safe to say that Joseph and Nicodemus didn't prepare a lot of bodies for burial. This is personal to them. They wrapped it and with the spices and strips of linen. This was in accordance with Jewish burial customs. At the place where Jesus was crucified, there was a garden. And in the garden, a new tomb in which no one had ever been laid. When I read that, I can't help but think that their hearts were heavy because of the opportunities lost. The times they didn't say, I know him. I'm for him. I think he's okay. I'm on his side. Amen. And now that day is past, as far as they know. And the only way they can express their devotion is treating his dead body with dignity and respect. Not allow it to be thrown into a pauper's grave. Folks, we don't want to be in that place. We want to be advocates for him. The very next chapter, John 20, this time it's the disciples. It says, on the evening of that first day of the week, when the disciples were together with the doors locked, here's our phrase again for fear of the Jews. This is John 20. We've followed this phrase all the way through John's gospel. The disciples were together with the doors locked for fear of the Jews. Jesus came and stood among them and said, peace be with you. And after he said this, he showed them his hands and his side. And the disciples were overjoyed when they saw the Lord. You think? <laughs> the Bible has this crazy gift for understatement. You know, the blind man in John 9, he came home seeing. 
And the disciples, after they're hiding because they think they're next and they're going to a Roman cross because their best friend, the most powerful man they ever knew, got executed by the Romans and they watched him suffocate on a cross. And now they're in lockdown because they know they're next. And Jesus steps into the room and John said, and they were overjoyed when they saw the Lord. I don't know what words you use for like out of their mind, ecstatic, beyond reason. But on Sunday, they have a private faith for fear of the Jews. It seems to me that contemporary Christians have a lot of private faith. Like our political leaders talk to us about freedom of worship, that they will allow us freedom of worship, that we can gather in our buildings and do whatever we want to, as long as we do it in our buildings. Just to be clear, what the Constitution affords us is freedom of religion. Very different thing. And we've had our little polite Sunday morning faith for too long. Don't tell me Jesus isn't welcome in the schools and don't tell me he's not welcome in the business place. Don't tell me he's not welcome in the public square. Don't tell me that. How dare you say that our heritage is unacceptable, that it has to be silenced. We're not afraid of the Jewish power brokers. We're afraid of different things. The power of one, you make a difference. You matter. This isn't somebody else that needs to stand up. It's not somebody else who needs to find a voice. It's not some other group who we wish would change or be different. It's us. Now, I want to wrap this up, or let me start to wrap this up. This is not my final ending. (laughs) Don't get excited. But the nature of being a believer in Jesus is an assignment that is inseparable from overcoming. It's just, it it, it is a distortion of the truth. It's a distortion of scripture to imagine that you can be a Christ follower, a believer, and not be required in time to be an overcomer. Jesus said, if anybody would be my disciple, you have to take up your cross daily and follow me. Not a cute little piece of jewelry to hang around your neck or to ornament your ears with. A cross was a tool of execution. In Revelation chapter 12 and verse 11, I put in parentheses the definitions of a couple of phrases that were used without having to unpack the entire context. They, the believers on earth, overcame him, Satan, by the blood of the lamb and the word of their testimony. And they didn't love their lives so much as to shrink from death. That's the distinction from so many people we just looked at in John's gospel. There were things they were holding on to so they couldn't find their voice for Jesus. There were approvals they wanted or permissions to be given or they wanted to be included in some groups of people. And so they couldn't find their voice for Jesus. The book, but the book of Revelation is a book that tells us how we can not only survive, but how we can accomplish God's purposes at the end of the age when things get pretty tense. It begins with letters to seven churches. And there's a diagnosis given by Jesus himself to every church in the, in the first chapter. Jesus is standing in the midst of his church. These seven churches. Do you know Jesus is still standing in the midst of his churches? I promise you. And to each of those seven churches, he said, these are your strengths and these are your weaknesses. And these are the course corrections you need to make. And to the one who overcomes, everyone is told they have to overcome. And then at the end of the book of Revelation, it says, who's welcomed into this kingdom? Those who overcame. That's our assignment. It presupposes difficulty and obstacles and challenges and hurdles and resistance and unwanted things and uninvited things. It presupposes difficulty. The book of Revelation is a difficult book. And right here in the middle of it in chapter 12, it says the believers on earth overcame Satan by the blood of the lamb and the word of their testimony. And they didn't love their lives so much as to shrink from death. The power of your God story is irrefutable. There's much I don't know about God. There's much I don't know about my Bible, but I can tell you what I know he's done for me. You can believe it. You can choose not to believe it, but you can't talk me out of it. It's my story. And you've got a God story. 
how he's forgiven you and helped you and delivered you. We've got to use our God stories. You've got to give voice to it. You've got to express it. Don't let anybody that knows you not know your God story. And I hope you're not telling one that's 40 years old. That may be your entree, but I hope you got one from last week. It seems to me there's a parallel with Revelation 12 and what we happens in the book of Exodus. The Passover, you know that story? They're about ready to leave Egypt. So far, the challenge has not worked out so well. There have been a lot of demonstrations of God's power, but the pressure on the Hebrew slaves has increased. And finally, God said, it's time. We're going to finish this. Tonight, death's coming. The firstborn in every house in Egypt will die, whether it's human or animal. The only exception are the houses where the blood of a lamb has been captured in a basin and splattered on the doorpost of a house with hyssop. It's a common weed in the region. If there's blood on the doorpost of the house, death will pass over. It's where we get the word Passover. But if there's no blood on the house, the firstborn will die, whether human or animal. Can you imagine what would happen in Rutherford County if in every house tonight the firstborn died? Can you imagine the fear and the cry in the streets before the sun came up? And there's only one pocket of exceptions. It's where the, the blood was on the doorpost. It's Exodus 12. Take a bunch of hyssop, dip it in the blood in the basin and put some of the blood on the top and both sides of the door frame. Not one of you shall go out the door of the house until morning. And when the Lord goes through the land to strike down the Egyptians, he'll see the blood on the top and the sides of the door frame and will pass over that doorway. He'll not permit the destroyer to enter your houses and strike you down. Well, couldn't God have just softened Pharaoh's heart and let him all? I suppose, but I don't know why. But I know he required obedience of his people. Do you think there's any chance that some of the Jewish people chose not to cooperate with Moses? Before you answer, let me ask another question. Did everybody cooperate with Moses after that? Hardly. You would think if you had seen the Passover, you'd do whatever Mo said. Right? If Moses had said, don't ever eat chocolate again, you'd been burning your chocolate stash. I mean, after everybody in the whole nation died except where the blood was, I'm thinking he's got a good list of good followers. No, they grumbled their way. Within 72 hours, they're complaining. I promise not everybody cooperated. Ephesians 1, 7, in him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins in accordance with the riches of his grace. That's our story. We weren't redeemed from Egyptian slavery. We were delivered from the slavery of sin through the blood of Jesus. We're not moralist or ethicist. We didn't find a good church because we like to sing the choruses. Jesus changed our lives and he can change your life. Do you know him? Well, they'll think I'm goofy. They already do. You're good if they think you're a goofy UT fan. They haven't won a championship since Jesus was here. (laughs) And we don't care. We keep wearing orange and white because this is our year. (laughs) And if you represent Vanderbilt, you're in a whole other category. God bless you. I believe Overcomers, But understand this, there are different choices. This isn't automatic. Not everybody that sits under the umbrella of the church, not everybody that you know is going to get this. Acts chapter 5, we've already looked at that a little earlier. They called the apostles in. They had them flogged. Fancy word for beaten. They ordered them not to speak in the name of Jesus, and they let them go. And the apostles left the Sanhedrin rejoicing because they'd been counted worthy to suffer disgrace for the name. And day after day, in the temple courts and from house to house, they never stopped. They never stopped teaching and proclaiming the good news that Jesus is the Christ. Now, they've been marked up. Their backs have been opened up. But they said, we're not going to stop. Contrast that. Matthew 28, resurrection day. A lot of drama at the tomb where Joseph and, and Nicodemus have placed Jesus. Angelic visits, rocks rolling, angelic messages, a lot of drama. And while the women were on their way, some of the guards went into the city and reported to the chief priest everything that had happened. They saw the angels. 
Remember what they did? They acted like dead men. They knew when to be quiet. They played possum. They know what happened. They saw the rock rolled away. They saw the angel. They they saw it. And now they've gone to give a report to the chief priest over everything that happened. When the chief priest had met with the elders and devised a plan, they gave the soldiers a large sum of money. This is what you're supposed to say. His disciples came during the night and stole him away while we were asleep. If this report gets to the governor, we'll satisfy him and keep you out of trouble. That's important because they were assigned to guard the tomb. And if the thing they're guarding escapes, if the person they're guarding escapes, they'll be, they'll be executed. So this is a really awkward place. And, and they, they said, you, you tell our story. We will cover for you with the governor. So the soldiers took the money and did as they were instructed. This story's been widely circulated among the Jews to this day. We've got two scenarios here, folks. Peter and John are beaten. Their backs are laid open. Don't mention his name again. They're not offered any money. They're threatened. If you keep this up, we'll finish what we just started. Do you hear me? And they know they have the power to do it. They watched him execute Jesus. And it says they left that place to thank God we're worthy to suffer for our Lord. And day after day, in place after place, and from house to house, they never stopped telling their God story. Now, the guards, on the other hand, they've got some Roman authority behind them. They could look at these Jewish power brokers and say, you mean you're, you are ordering a Roman soldier? Well, how dare you? They took the money. They took the money. Different choices. I'm really inviting you towards a different attitude. I've spent my life in the church. Since I was about 10 years old, I have gathered with Christians in the craziest places. Church buildings, motel ballrooms, on beaches, in tents, in various nations. I've spent my life around the church. But what started last year and what we're walking through now is calling for a new attitude amongst us. I think it's pretty accurately described in 2 Corinthians 4. We have this treasure in jars of clay to show that this all-surpassing power is from God and not from us. We are hard-pressed on every side, but not crushed. We are perplexed, but not in despair. We're persecuted, but not abandoned. We're struck down, but not destroyed. We always carry around in our body the death of Jesus so that the life of Jesus may also be revealed in our body. Before last year, a challenge for us, before last year, a challenge for us is when somebody sat in our seat in the context of our faith, or they parked in our parking place, or we didn't like the worship set, or pastor's sermon was too long again. We're in a different place. And I'm not even offering that as a condemnation of where we were. Maybe it was adequate for the season we're in, but we're in a new season. And it's going to require a new cadence from us, a new response from us, a new courage from us. But God's given us what we need. He's kept us. And he will help us. I I want to close with this, and this is true. I really am now. I think it's important to acknowledge that as in our overcoming, even heroes wrestle with fear. So that it's not a weakness in you or an inadequacy in you. When you, when you pause to say, you know, okay, do I have the courage to do this? Or I'm tired of standing. It's not a failure of your character. It's a part of the human condition. Don't give in to it. Don't yield to it. But understand, even those who make heroic responses still wrestle with fear. I gave you, it's 1 Kings 19. I'll, I'll just summarize. It's Elijah. Immediately preceding this, he's called fire from heaven on command. Not like sometime in the next 90 days, let there be a lightning storm. He called it on command. And he's challenged the whole nation to repent of their idolatry. And he's executed personally hundreds of idolatrous prophets of Baal. Tremendous victory. Tremendous courage. But then the message comes to him. 
that Jezebel says, by this time tomorrow, I'll have your head. And look what it says. He was afraid and arose and ran for his life. Until he came to Beersheba. You, you, you probably wouldn't know the geography. That confrontation took place on the Mount Carmel. If you go to a modern day map of Israel, find the port city of Haifa. It's on the northern part of Israel. Mount Carmel is right there next to the port city of Haifa. And then you can find Beersheba on a modern day map. He ran from Mount Carmel to Beersheba. He went a long way into the desert. And he didn't stop there, he kept running. He is struggling. And just, just look at the last verse there, verse seven. The angel of the Lord came a second time and touched him and said, arise and eat because the journey is too great for you. God sent angels to help him. He said, I know you've stood in a hard place and I, I know you've done heavy lifting and I know what you've accomplished is beyond your physical strength. Folks, I, I'm not asking you to stand up just in your strength. I'm not asking you just to marshal your courage or to summon your fortitude. I'm asking you to be more aware that we are children of the King and the power of one. When you choose to cooperate with the spirit of God has a significance beyond anything we know how to estimate. We're not just church attenders or quiet people. We're not being trained to be polite or tame. We're here on an assignment and the future of the place where we live is not really clear at the moment. I don't think the outcome has been decided and I think there's a great deal still in play and I think outcomes have an enormous part to do with the heart of the church, not to be angry, not to be violent, not to be accusing of others, to humble ourselves before the Lord and say, forgive me. Amen. I've wanted to be accepted. I've wanted to fit in. I haven't really wanted to be ostracized because of my faith. So I haven't said much. I've been kind of quiet, but it's a new day. If you read the disciples in the book, the gospels, they look like Keystone cops or the three stooges or something. You wouldn't have bet the future of our faith upon that. But after the day of Pentecost, they're a different group of characters altogether. And it, we can tell our story in the same way, you know, prior to that, we were one thing. But God changed us. Amen. We'll sit outside and have church. Let it rain. It's okay. Amen. We'll go where we need to do. We're going to be together. Amen. I brought you a prayer. Really what I brought you is the doxology to the book of Jude. It's the conclusion of the book of Jude. But the language is so beautiful. I wanted you to have it. It's worth repeating. It's worth memorizing, honestly. Let's stand together and say these words together as our conclusion. Have you found it? They'll put it on the screens too. Look at that. You don't have to be smart if you have smart friends. <laughs> that is so good. I couldn't turn those projectors on if I needed to, but it's, let's say this together to him who is able to keep us from falling and to present us before his glorious presence without fault and with great joy. To the only God, our Savior, be glory, majesty, power, and authority. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, before all ages, now and forevermore, amen. I think we ought to say that again. That's really good stuff to be declaring over our lives. Can we do it again? And then I'll let you go, I promise. To him who is able to keep us from falling and to present us before his glorious presence without fault and with great joy. To the only God, our Savior, be glory, majesty, power, and authority through Jesus Christ our Lord before all ages, now and forevermore. Amen. Hallelujah. Join us every week for another exciting message from Pastor Alan Jackson. And until then, visit us online and discover remarkable information and resources to help take your Christian life to the next level. And if you're visiting the Nashville area, we'd love to see you at World Outreach Church in Murfreesboro. We're easy to find, so look us up when you're traveling through. And don't forget to connect with Pastor Jackson every day through social media. 
Thanks so much for joining us and being a part of this ministry. We'll see you again next time for another encounter with Pastor Alan Jackson. Hey, this is Pastor Allen. Thank you for watching this video. If you enjoyed it, like it, and most importantly, share it with your friends. If you want to be notified when there's new content, when we post new material, if you'll just subscribe to my channel and hit the bell, you'll get the notification. Most of all, I pray God blesses you as you continue on your spiritual journey and open your heart to the Lord. God bless.